chapter 15. Before a handful of days had passed, it seemed to Wang Ling that he had never been away from his land, as indeed in his heart he never had. With three pieces of the gold, he bought good seed from the south, full grains of wheat and of rice and of corn, and for very recklessness of riches, he bought seeds the like of which he had never planted before, celery and lotus, and his pond for his pond, and great red radishes that are stewed with pork for a feast dish, and small red fragrant beans. With five gold pieces, he bought an ox from a farmer plowing in the field, and this before he reached his own land. He saw the man plowing, and he stopped, and they all stopped, the old man and the children and the woman, eager as they were to reach the house in the land, and they looked at the ox. Wang Ling had been struck with its strong neck, and he noticed at once the sturdy pulling of its shoulder against the wooden yoke. And he called out, That is a worthless ox. What will you sell it for in silver or gold, seeing that I have no animal and am hard put to it and willing to take anything? And the farmer called back, I would sooner sell my wife than this ox, which is but three years old and in its prime. And he plowed on and would not stop for Wang Lung. Okay, so you, you can imagine that this is just the natural uh, bargaining uh, that, is, uh, rep that is typical of this culture. Then it seemed to Wang Lung as if out of all the oxen the world held, he must have this one. And he said to Olan and to his father, how is it for an ox? Like, what do you think? Is it a good ox? And the old man peered and said, It seems a bit, it seems a beast well castrated, so it's been uh, sterilized. And Olan said, It is a year older than he says. But Wang Lung answered nothing because upon this ox he had set his heart because of its steady pulling of, of the soil and because of its smooth yellow coat and its full dark eye. With this ox, he could plow his fields and cultivate them. And with this ox tied to his meal, he could grind the grain. And he went to the farmer and said, I will give you enough to buy another ox and more, but this ox will I have. At last, after bickering and quarreling and false starts away, the farmer yielded for half again the worth of an ox in those parts. But gold was suddenly nothing to Wang Lung when he looked at this ox, and he passed it over to the farmer's hand, and he watched while the farmer unyoked the beast, and Wang Lung led it away with a rope through its nostrils, his heart burning with his possession. When they reached the house, they found the door torn away, and the thatch from the roof gone, and within, their hoes and rakes that they had left were gone, so only the bare rafters and the earthen walls remained. And even the earthen walls were worn down with the belated snows and the rains of winter and early spring. But after the first astonishment, all this was as nothing to Wang Lung. He went away to the town and he bought a good new plow of hard wood and two rakes and two hoes and mats to cover the roof until they could grow thatch again from the harvest. Then in the evening he stood in the doorway of his house and looked across the land, his own land, lying loose and fresh from the winter's freezing and ready for planting. It was full spring and in the shallow pool the frogs croaked drowsily. The bamboos at the corner of the house swayed slowly under a gentle night wind, and through the twilight he could see dimly the fringe of trees at the border of the near field. They were peach trees, budded most delicately pink, and willow trees thrusting forth tender green leaves, and up from the quiescent waiting land a faint mist rose, silver as moonlight and clung about the tree trunks. At first, and for a long time, 
It seemed to Wang Lung that he wished to see no human being, but only to be alone on his land. He went to no houses of the village, and when they came to him, those who were left of the winter starving, he was surly with them. Which of you tore away my door? And which of you have my rake and my hoe? And which of you burned my roof in his oven? Thus he bawled at them, and they shook their heads full of virtue. And this one said, it was your uncle. And that one said, nay, with bandits and robbers roving over the land in these evil times of famine and war, how can it be said that this one or that stole anything? Hunger makes thief of any man. Then Ching, his neighbor, came creeping forth from his house to see Wang Lung, and he said, Through the winter, a band of robbers lived in your house and preyed upon the village and the town as they were able. Your uncle, it is said, knows more of them than an honest man should. But who knows what is true in these days? I would not dare to accuse any man. This man was nothing but a shadow indeed. So close did his skin stick to his bones, and so thin and gray had his hair grown, although he had not yet reached 45 years of his age. So Ching looks like an old man, even though he's only 45. Wang Lung stared at him a while, and then in compassion, he said suddenly, Now you have fared worse than we, and what have you eaten? And the man sighed forth in a whisper, What have I not eaten? Awful? That's like roadkill. From the streets, like dogs when we begged in the town, and dead dogs we ate. And once before she died, my woman brewed some soup from flesh. I dared not ask what it was, except that I knew she had not the courage to kill. And if we ate, it was something she found. Then she died, having less strength than I to endure. And after she died, I gave the, so the girl to a soldier because I could not see her starve and die also. He paused and fell silent, and after a time he said, If I had a little seed, I would plant once more, but no seed have I. Come here, cried Wang Lung roughly, and dragged him into the house by the hand, and he bade the man hold up the ragged tail of his coat, and into it Wang Lung poured from the store of seed he had bought from the south. So you see that Wang Lung has forgiven Ching from stealing from him. Wheat he gave him and rice and cabbage seed. And he said, tomorrow I will come and plow your land with my good ox. So this, this is probably uncommon mercy for, for Wang Lung to have. And it just shows again he, that he is just a bit nicer or maybe a lot nicer for his culture than he would be expected to be. Then Ching began to weep suddenly, and Wang Lung rubbed his own eyes and cried out as if he were angry. So we see that Wang Lung is rubbing his eyes. He's trying not to cry, and he speaks in a harsh tone, though we know that in his heart he's very merciful. Do you think I have forgotten that you gave me that handful of beans? But Ching could answer nothing. Only he walked away weeping and weeping without stop. Okay. It was joy to Wang Lung to find that his uncle was no longer in the village and where he was, none knew, certainly. Some said he had gone to a city and some said he was in far distant parts with his wife and his son, but there was not one left in his house in the village. The girls, and this Wang Lung heard with stout anger, were sold the prettiest first for the price they could bring, but even the last one who was pockmarked was sold for a handful of pence to a soldier who was passing through to battle. Then Wang Lung set himself robustly to the soil, and he begrudged or resented even the hours he must spend in the house for food and sleep. He loved rather to take his roll of bread and garlic to the field and stand there eating and planning, thinking. 
Here shall I put the black-eyed peas, and here the young rice beds. And if he grew too weary in the day, he laid himself into a furrow, and there with the good warmth of his own land against his flesh, he slept. And Olan in the house was not idle. With her own hands, she lashed the mats firmly to the rafters and took earth from the fields and mixed it with water and mended the walls of the house. And she built again the oven and filled the holes in the floor that the rain had washed. Then she went into the town one day with Wang Ling and together they bought beds and a table and six benches and a great iron cauldron, and then they bought for pleasure a red clay teapot with a black flower marked on it in ink and six bowls to match. Last of all, they went into an incense shop and bought a paper god of wealth to hang on the wall over the table in the middle room, and they bought two pewter candlesticks and a pewter incense urn and two red candles to burn before the god thick red candles of cow's fat and having a slender reed through the middle for wick. And with this, Wang Lung thought of the two small gods in the temple to the earth. And on his way home, he went in and peered at them, and they were piteous to behold, their features washed from their faces with rain, and the clay of their bodies naked and sticking through the tatters of their paper clothes. None had paid any heed to them in this dreadful year, and Wang Lin looked at them grimly and with content, and he said aloud as one might speak to a punished child, thus it is with gods who do evil to men. So you can see that he's saying that the gods deserve this. Nevertheless, when the house was itself again, and the pewter candlesticks gleaming, and the candles burning in them shining red, and the teapot and the bowls upon the table, and the beds in their places with a little bedding once more, and fresh paper pasted over the hole in the room where he slept, and a new door hung upon its wooden hinges, Wang Lung was afraid of his happiness. So his superstition is returning, isn't it? Olan grew great with the next child. His children tumbled like brown puppies about his threshold, and against the southern wall, his old father sat and dozed and smiled as he slept. In his fields, the young rice sprouted as green as jade and more beautiful, and the young beans lifted their hooded heads from the soil. And now pay attention to this sentence. And out of the gold, there was still enough left to feed them until the harvest, if they ate sparingly. So you see, all that gold that he got from that wealthy man, you see that really all it has done is enabled them to start over. They have been able to buy an ox and plenty of seed, they have been able to replenish their farm tools like their hoes and rakes. They have replenished their house by buying table, benches, etc. cetera. Uh, so a few decorative items, but you can see that they do not have tons of money besides this. See, they just have enough to feed them until the harvest comes if they eat sparingly. Looking at the blue heaven above him and the white clouds driving across it, feeling upon the plowed fields as upon his own flesh the sun and rain in proportion, Wang Lung muttered unwillingly, I must stick a little incense before those two small gods in the small temple. After all, they have power over earth. Chapter 16. This is going to be a life-changing chapter. For sure, one of the most pivotal chapters in the book. One night, as Wang lay with his wife, he felt a hard lump the size of a man's closed hand between her breast. And he said to her, Now what is this thing that you have on your body? He put his hand to it, and he found a cloth-wrapped bundle that was hard, yet moved to his touch. She drew back violently at first, 
And then when he laid hold of it to pluck it away from her, she yielded and said, well, look at it then if you must. And she took the string which held it to her neck and broke it and gave him the thing. It was wrapped in a bit of rag and he tore this away. Then suddenly into his hand fell a mass of jewels and Wang Lung gazed at them stupefied. There were such a mass of jewels as one had never dreamed could be together. Jewels red as the inner flesh of watermelons, golden as wheat, green as young leaves in spring, clear as water trickling out of the earth. Now, what the names of them were, Wang did not know, having never heard names and seen jewels together in his life. So we can guess what the names of these jewels were, huge diamonds and rubies and emeralds, etc. But holding them there in his hand, in the hollow of his brown hard hand, he knew from the gleaming and glittering in the half-dark room that he held wealth. So all that gold that was stolen from the, the fat man in the big house, that just enabled them to start over. This is different. These jewels are a fortune that never could have, be get, that never could have been earned in a lifetime. He held it motionless, drunk with color and shape, speechless. And together, he and the woman stared at what he held. At last, he whispered to her, breathless, where, where? And she whispered back softly, in the rich man's house. It must have been a favorite's treasure. I saw a brick loosened in the wall, and I slipped there carelessly so no other soul could see and demand a share. I pulled the brick away, caught the shining, and put them in my sleeve. Now, how did you know, he whispered again, filled with admiration. And she answered with a smile on her lips that was never in her eyes. Do you think I have not lived in a rich man's house? The rich are always afraid. I saw robbers in a bad year once rush into the gate of the great house and the slaves and the concubines and even the old mistress herself ran hither and thither and each had a treasure that she thrust into some secret place already planned. Therefore, I knew the meaning of a loosened brick. And again they fell silent, staring at the wonder of the stones. Then after a long time, Wang Lin drew in his breath and said resolutely, Now, treasure like this one cannot keep. It must be sold and put into safety, into land, for nothing else is safe. Remember that time that he has robbed? was robbed, he knows what it's like for people to come storming into his house and ransack it, tear it apart for, for money. If any knew of this, we would be dead by the next day and a robber would carry the jewels. They must be put into land this very day or I shall not sleep in, or, or I shall not sleep tonight. And so we see that still his priority, he sees land as the only worthwhile investment. He wrapped the stones in the rag again as he spoke and tied them hard together with the string and opening his coat to thrust them into his bosom, just by chance, he saw the woman's face. She was sitting cross-legged upon the bed at its foot and her heavy face that never spoke of anything was moved with a dim yearning of open lips and face thrust forward. In other words, he can tell just by, he, his eyes happen to glimpse her face and he can tell because he has grown so used to her that she's wanting to say something. Well, and now what? He said, wondering at her. Will you sell them all? She asked in a hoarse whisper. And why not then, he answered, astonished. Why should we have jewels like this in an earthen house? I wish I could 
keep two for myself, she said, with such helpless wistfulness as of one expecting nothing. So, you know, we've never seen Olan ask for anything. That he was moved, as he might be by one of his children longing for a, a toy or for a little sweet. Well now, he cried in amazement. If I could have two, she went on humbly, only two small ones, two small white pearls even. So you can see that she asks for the smallest of the jewels. She doesn't take advantage of, of this moment. She just asks for some small token. <coughs> so sorry. Oh, um, you know, by she's been rejected her whole life. She's never, she's never had anything nice at all. Pearls, he repeated agape. I would keep them. I, I would not wear them, she said. Only keep them. Like she knows that she uh, would never go anywhere, that she would need to wear something fancy. And she dropped her eyes and fell to twisting a bit of the bedding where a, where a thread was loosened. And she waited patiently as one who scarcely expects an answer. Then Wang Ling, without comprehending it, looked for an instant into the heart of this dull and faithful creature who had labored all her life at some task at which she won no reward, and who in the great house had seen others wearing jewels which she had never even felt in her hand once. I could hold them in my hand sometimes, she added, as she thought to herself. And he was moved by something he did not understand. So he doesn't understand this sympathy that he feels for her, but he's moved by it. And he pulled the jewels from his bosom and unwrapped them and handed the, them to her in silence. And she searched among the glittering colors, her hard brown hand turning over the stones delicately and lingeringly until she found the two smooth white pearls, and these she took, and tying up the others again, she gave them back to him. Then she took the pearls, and she tore a bit of the corner of her coat away, and wrapped them and hid them between her breasts, and was comforted. But Wang Lu watched her astonished and only half understanding so that afterwards during the day and on other days, he would stop and stare at her and say to himself, well now, this woman of mine, she has those two pearls between her breasts still, I suppose, but he never saw her take them out and look at them and they never spoke of them at all. And uh, we could have a great discussion if we were all together. But you know that these two pearls represent something. Uh, why did her husband let her keep them? There was no reason to let a piece of furniture keep two pearls, right? And that's the attitude with which women are viewed in this culture. So why does he let her keep them? They must represent, they must be a token of something. It's one of those abstract nouns we were talking about in our hangout last week. As for the other jewels, he pondered this way and that, and at last decided he would go to the great house and see if there were more land to buy. To the great house he now went, and there was in these days no gateman standing at the gate, twisting the long hairs of his mole, scornful of those who could not enter past him into the house of Wang. Instead, the great gates were locked, and Wang Ling pounded against them with both fists, and no one came. Men who passed in the streets looked up and cried out at him, Ah, you may pound now and pound again. If the old Lord is awake, he may come. And if there is a stray dog of a slave about that, she may open if she's inclined to it. So maybe the old 
house is no longer respected in the town. But at last he heard slow footsteps coming across the threshold, slow wandering footsteps that halted and came on by fits. And then he heard the slow drawing of the iron bar that held the gate and the gate creaked and a cracked voice whispered, who is it? Then Wang Ling answered loudly, although he was shocked or amazed, it is I, Wang Ling. Then the voice said, peevishly that you know means easily irritated now who is the accursed Wang Lung and Wang Lung perceived by the quality of the curse that it was the old Lord himself because he curses one accustomed to servants and slaves Wang Lung therefore answered more humbly than before sir and Lord I am come on a little business not to disturb your Lordship but to talk a little business with the agent who serves your honor then the old lord answered without opening any wider the crack through which he pursed his lips now curse him that dog left me many months ago and he is not here wang ling did not do, know what to do after this reply it was impossible to talk of buying land directly to the old lord without a middleman and yet the jewels hung in his bosom hot as fire and he wanted to be rid of them and more than that he wanted the land with the seed he had, he could plant as much land again as he had, and he wanted the good land of the house of Wang. I come about a little money, he said hesitatingly. At once, the old Lord pushed the gates together. He shuts the gates because he's thinking, I don't have any money. There's no money in this house, he said more loudly than he had yet spoken. The thief and robber of an agent and may his mother and his mother's mother be cursed for him took all that I had. No debts can be paid. No, no, called Wang Lung hastily. I came to pay out, not to collect debt. At this, there was a shrill scream from a voice Wang Lung had not yet heard, and a woman thrust her face suddenly out of the gates. Now that is a thing I have not heard for a long time, she said sharply, and Wang Lung saw a handsome, shrewish, high-colored face looking out at him. So this is obviously a, a slave woman, a concubine, if you will. Come in, she said briskly, and she opened the gates wide enough to admit him and then behind his back while he stood astonished in the court. She barred them securely again. The old Lord stood there coughing and staring a dirty gray satin robe wrapped about him from which hung an edge of bedraggled fur. Once it had been a fine garment as anyone could see, for the satin was still heavy and smooth, although stains and spots covered it and it was wrinkled as, it, as though it had been used for a bedgown. Wang Ling stared back at the old lord, curious yet half afraid, for all his life he had feared the people in the great house, and it seemed impossible that the old lord of whom he had heard so much was this old figure, no more dreadful than his old father, and indeed less so, for his father was a cleanly and smiling old man, and the old lord who had been fat was now lean, and his skin hung in folds about him, and he was unwashed and unshaven, and his hand was yellow and trembled as he passed it over his chin and pulled at his loose old lips. The woman was cleaning up. She had a hard, sharp face, a handsome sort with a handsome with a sort of hawk's beauty of high bridged nose and keen bright black eyes and pale skin stretched too tightly over her bones and her cheeks and lips were red and hard. Her black hair was like a mirror for smooth shining blackness, but from her speech, one could perceive she was not of the Lord's family, but a slave, sharp voiced and bitter tongued. So she doesn't act like a high class person. And besides these two, the woman and the old Lord, there was not another person in the court where before Men and women and children had run to and fro on their business of caring for the great house. Now about money, said the woman sharply, but Wang Ling hesitated. He could not well speak before the old Lord, 
And this the woman instantly perceived, as she perceived everything more quickly than speech could be made out of it, about it. And she said to the old man shrilly, now off with you, because see, you know, Wang Lung is still of a very much lower class than the old Lord. And so it's not appropriate in his culture for him to speak to any but a middleman. And the aged Lord, without a word, shambled silently away, his old velvet shoes flapping in off at his heels, coughing as he went. As for Wang Lung, left alone with this woman, he did not know what to say or do. He was stupefied with the silence everywhere. He glanced into the next court, and there was still no other person. And about the court he saw heaps of refuse and filth and scattered straw and branches of bamboo trees and dried pine needles and the dead stalks of flowers as though not for a long time had anyone taken a broom to sweep it. Now then, wooden head, said the woman with exceeding sharpness, and Wang Lung jumped at the sound of her voice. So unexpected was its shrillness. What is your business? If you have money, let me see it. Now you're going to see that just as Wang Lung cannot do business himself directly with this old lord, he doesn't want to do business with a woman. No, said Wang Lung with caution. I did not say that I had money. I have business. Business means money, returned the woman, either money coming in or money going out, and there is no money to go out of this house. Well, but I cannot speak with a woman, objected Wang Lung mildly. He could make nothing of the situation in which he found himself, and he was still staring about him. Well, and why not, retorted the woman with anger. Then she shouted at him suddenly, have you not heard, fool, that there is no one here? Wang Lung stared at her feebly, unbelieving, and the woman shouted at him again, I and the old Lord, there is no one else. Where then, asked Wang Lung, too much aghast to make sense of these words. Well, and the old mistress is dead, retorted the woman. Have you not heard in the town how bandits swept into the house and how they carried away what they would of the slaves and of, those, and of the goods? And they hung the old lord up by his thumbs and beat him. And the old mistress they tied in a chair and gagged her and everyone ran. But I stayed. I hid in a gong half full of water under a wooden lid. And when I came out, they were gone. And the old mistress sat dead in her chair, not from any touch they had given her, but from fright. Her body was a rotten reed with the opium she smoked and she could not endure the fright. And the servants and the slaves, gasped Wang Lung, and the gatemen, oh, those, she answered carelessly, they were gone long ago. All those who had been had feet to carry them away, for there was no food and no money by the middle of the winter. Indeed, her voice fell to a whisper, there are many of the men servants among the bandits. I saw that dog of a gateman myself. He was leading the way, although he turned his face aside in the old Lord's presence. Still, I knew those three long hairs of his mole. And there were others, for how could any but those familiar with the great house know where jewels were hid and the secret treasure stores of things not to be sold? I would not put it beneath the old agent himself, although he would consider it beneath his dignity to appear publicly in the affair, since he is a sort of distant relative to the family. The woman fell silent, and the silence of the courts was heavy as silence can be after life has gone. Then she said, But all this was not a sudden thing. All during the lifetime of the old lord and of his father, the fall of this house has been coming. In the last generation, the Lord ceased to see the land and took the monies the agents gave them and spent it carelessly as water. And in these generations, the strength of the land has gone from them and bit by bit, the land has begun to go also. Where are the young lords? asked Wang Lung, still staring about him. So impossible was it for him to believe these things. Hither and thither, said the woman indifferently. 
It is good fortune that the two girls were married away before the thing happened. The elder young lord, when he heard what had befallen his father and his mother, sent a messenger to take the old lord, his father. But I persuaded the old head not to go. I said, who will be in the court? And it is not seemly for me, who am only a woman. She pursed her narrow red lips virtuously. That means like she just did this out of respect for the old Lord. As she spoke these words and cast down her bold eyes. And again she said when she had paused a little. Besides, I have been my Lord's faithful slave for these several years. And I have no other house. So she's a concubine to the old Lord. Wang Lun looked at her closely then and turned quickly away. He began to perceive what this was, a woman who clung to an old and dying man because of what last thing she might get from him. He said with contempt, seeing that you are only a slave, how can I do business with you? At that, she cried out at him, he will do anything I tell him. Wang Lun pondered over this reply, well, and there was the land. Others would buy it through this woman if he did not. How much land is there left? He asked her unwillingly. And she saw instantly what his purpose was. If you have come to buy land, she said quickly, there is land to buy. He has a hundred acres to the west and to the south, 200 that he will sell. It is not all in one piece, but the plots are large. It can be sold to the last acre. This she said so readily that Wang Ling perceived she knew everything the old man had left, even to the last foot of land. But still he was unbelieving and not willing to do business with her. It is not likely the old Lord can sell all the land of his family without the agreement of his sons, he demurred. But the woman met his words eagerly. As for that, the sons have told him to sell when he can. The land is where no one of the sons wishes to live, and the country is run over with bandits in these times of famine, and they have all said, we cannot live in such a place. Let us sell and divide the money. But into who, whose hand would I put the money? Asked Wang Lin, still unbelieving. Into the old Lord's hand, and whose else? Replied the woman smoothly. But Wang Ling knew that the old Lord's hand opened into hers. He would not therefore talk further with her, but turned away saying, another day, another day. And he went to the gate and she followed him, shrieking after him into the street. This time tomorrow, this time, or this afternoon, all times are alike. He went down the street without answer, greatly puzzled and needing to think over what he had heard. He went into the small tea shop and ordered tea of the slavey. And when the boy had put it smartly before him and with an impudent gesture had caught and tossed the penny he paid for it, Wang Lung fell to musing. And the more he mused, the more monstrous it seemed that the great and rich family who all his own life and all his father's and grandfather's lives long had been a power and a glory in the town were now fallen and scattered. It comes of their leaving the land, he thought regretfully. And he thought of his own two sons who were growing like young bamboo shoots in the spring. And he resolved that on this very day he would make them cease playing in the sunshine and he would set them to tasks in the field where they would early take into their bone and their blood the fill of the soil under their feet and the fill of the hoe hard in their hands. So he is looking at the house of Wang and he is seeing how wealth corrupted that whole house that, so that they started spending their money on, on bad things. Uh, and so how they have fallen and he determines that he's going to prevent that in his own family by raising sons that are not corrupt. Well, but all this time here were these jewels hot and heavy against his body and he was continually afraid. 
It seemed as though their brilliance must shine through these rags and someone cry out, Now here's a poor man carrying an emperor's treasure. And he could not rest until they were changed into land. He watched, therefore, until the shopkeeper had a moment of idleness, and he called to the man and said, Come and drink a bowl at, at my cost, and tell me the news of the town, since I have been a winter away. The shopkeeper was always ready for such talk, especially if he drank his own tea at another's cost, and he sat down readily at Wang Lin's table, a small, weasel-faced man with a twisted and crossed left eye. His clothes were solid and black with grease down the front of his coat and trousers, for besides tea, he sold food also, which he cooked himself. And he was fond of saying, there is a proverb, a good cook has never a clean coat. And so he considered himself justly and necessarily filthy. He sat down and began at once. Well, and beyond the starving of the people, which is no news, the greatest news was the robbery at the house of Wang. It was just what Wang Lu hoped to hear, and the man went on to tell him of it with relish, describing how the few slaves left had screamed, and how they had been carried off, and how the concubines that remained had been raped and driven out, and some even taken away, so that now none cared to live in that house at all. None, the man finished, except the old lord, who is now wholly the creature of a slave called Cuckoo, who for many years has been in the old lord's chamber while others came and went because of her cleverness. And has this woman command then? Asked Wang Lung, listening closely, like, is she the boss? For the time she can do anything, replied the man. And so for the time she closes her hand on everything that can be held and swallows all that can be swallowed. Some day, of course, when the young lords have their affairs settled in other parts, they will come back, and then she cannot fool them with her talk of a faithful servant to be rewarded, and out she will go. But she has her living made now, although she lived to a hundred years. And the land, asked Wang Lung at last, quivering with his eagerness. The land, said the man blankly, to this shopkeeper, land meant nothing at all. Is it for sale? Wang Ling said impatiently. Oh, the land, answered the man with indifference, and then as a customer came in, he rose and called as he went. I've heard it's for sale except the piece where the family are buried for these six generations, and he went his way. Then Wang Ling rose also, having heard what he came to hear, and he went out and approached the great gates, and the woman came to open to him, and he stood without entering, and he said to her, Tell me first this, will the old Lord set his own seal to the deeds of sale? Like, can I get a proper title? And the woman answered eagerly, and her eyes were fastened on his. He will, he will on my life. Then Wang Lung said to her plainly, Will you sell the land for gold, or for silver, or for jewels? And her eyes glittered as she spoke, and she said, I will sell it for jewels.